Good morning and welcome to Timberwolf Church Faith University. My name is Tanisha Starks and I am honored to be your instructor for today. Let's open up in a brief word of prayer. Gracious Father, in the precious name of Jesus Christ, again, we come before you and we just say thank you. Thank you for another day that you've kept us and thank you for another week, another Sunday that you brought us together again in this uh Faith University class. I pray, Lord, that you would have your way in this class. I pray, God, that you would uh, speak through me, that you would give me utterance. I pray for those who would join us on today. Lord, every hearer, every student, Lord, that, God, you would uh, touch hearts and open hearts to, to be receptive to the lesson on today. Lord, that you would even strengthen and encourage someone, strengthen someone's faith, Lord, save somebody even uh, through this lesson on today. It's in Jesus' precious name that we pray. Amen. God bless you. <clears throat> today uh, is Christmas, and I just want to say Merry Christmas to uh, every one of you. Uh, and as it is Christmas, it's, it's befitting uh, that we talk about the birth of the Savior. That's our topic today the birth of the Savior. And our lesson text is coming from Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 17. And I'm going to read it in your hearing. <clears throat> and the word of the Lord reads, And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria, and all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them and the glory of the Lord shone round about them and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I will bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem, and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste, and found Mary and Joseph, and the babe, lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. Amen. I know that was quite a bit of reading, uh, but we're going to get an understanding. And again, today uh, we're talking about the birth of, of the, savior, the Savior. Today is Christmas. And uh, I know many people are preparing to celebrate with their families and preparing uh, to open up those Christmas presents that are under the tree. Uh, we know that today that uh, Christmas has been so commercialized that the attention has, has kind of been drawn away or taken away from the true meaning of Christmas and why we celebrate Christmas, which is the birth of, of Jesus Christ. We celebrate the birth of our Savior on this day. We don't really know exactly the day 
that he was born, that's not the point, but we set aside this time uh, traditionally to celebrate the fact that he was born. Um, and so we just want to uh, encourage you, uh, strengthen you and, and, and some of you and inform some who may not know the, the true story of Christmas. And as we just read uh, in Luke's account, uh, according to Luke chapter 2, we just read uh, the account and the circumstances surrounding uh, the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ. So today, our lesson outline, we're going to look at, uh, as we examine this week's text, uh, under the following topics, we're going to look at the unseen hand of God, the birth of the Son of God, and the birth announcement. Okay? So this is all coming from Luke chapter 2. And so we're going to kind of break this down. <clears throat> First, we want to talk about uh, the unseen hand of God. The prophet Micah had recorded uh, centuries earlier, about 700 years prior to the actual birth of Jesus Christ, he recorded and he prophesied uh, that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. And we can find that in uh, Micah chapter 5 and verse 2. Yet in our lesson text, we find that Joseph and Mary were residing at the time they were living in Nazareth. And we found that Nazareth is about some 90 miles north of Bethlehem. And so the dilemma is if the prophet Micah spoke the word of the Lord and said that the Savior was going to be born in Bethlehem and here Mary is pregnant and the scripture text tells us that she's great with child. She was great with child, which means she was far along in her pregnancy and probably close to the due, due date. And so in order for God's word to be fulfilled and God's word to come to pass, we have to look at how God works in the background to set up situations and set up circumstances to cause his word to be fulfilled, to cause his word to come to pass. And so God put in place and he set up a plan that would force uh, Joseph to leave Nazareth while Mary was pregnant and to go to Bethlehem. And he set up the scenario uh, using a heathen ruler at the time, right? He used a pagan Gentile ruler to call for a census for taxation purposes, okay? So we see God working in the background and so when Mary was great with child, Joseph learned for tax purposes that he needed to go to Bethlehem because he was a descendant of David. And so he had to go to uh, his place of birth uh, in order to be taxed. Okay, so this was a, a perfect situation where, you know, some people may say, oh, you know, you know, the the pagan ruler, uh, Caesar Augustus, he's taxing the people. Oh, whoa, whoa is me. He's taxing us. And, you know, it's, it's ne it never feels good to have to, you know, give up some of your earnings and pay taxes. But God can take a negative thing of what we may think or what may seem on the surface as negative to work his perfect will to fulfill his word, to work his perfect plan um, for our lives. So this is uh, us seeing God's hand uh, in the background, the unseen hand of God. And so uh, likewise, as believers, we should never um, condition ourselves to think that things just happen to us and, oh, it was just by chance you know, that this occurred. It was just by chance that these events unfolded in my life. Nothing is just by chance. 
uh, as believers, we should look at everything as by the divine appointment um, of God. Okay. Next, we want to examine in our lesson text the birth of the Son of God. Okay. And so in the circumstances surrounding the birth of Jesus, the census required people to register in the place of their ancestral home. We talked about that. And since Joseph was of the line of David, he traveled to the city of David, which was Bethlehem. Going up from Galilee sounds strange since Bethlehem was south of Galilee, about, again, 80 or 90 miles south from uh, Galilee, where Joseph and Mary uh, had resided. But it was more to do with the elevation uh, than direction. So basically, Bethlehem was known uh, for its mountainous uh, land. And so with anywhere people traveled to Bethlehem, they said we're going up to Bethlehem because it was a high city, uh, so to speak, just to, to make it uh, plain. Uh, Mary was not required to go with Joseph but we find her by his side. She is called his espoused wife, which indicates their betrothal had taken place. But we also know that the marriage was not consummated until after the birth of Jesus, according to Matthew 1 and 25. We do not know just how close Mary was to delivering, but she was great with child. Again, Luke 2, 5 says she was great with child, okay? And some of the things that we want to point out, I want to point out, let me grab my Bible here, um, concerning the, the birth of our Savior. I want to go to uh, verse 6, Luke 2, 6 and 7. Let's look at those two verses really briefly. Uh, verse 6, and so it was that, and so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. Okay, I want to pause there for a minute because some people uh, look at the birth of Jesus and we know that um, um, the birth of Jesus was miraculous because Jesus was born and Mary became impregnated by the Holy Spirit. Okay, she didn't have to uh, have another party involved other than other than the the party of God, right? And so, uh, many people look at that and they question and wonder. Well, if God could do such a miraculous thing, such as causing a woman to be pregnant without engaging in uh, the activity, you know that that you know causes a woman to get pregnant, uh, sexual intercourse, without engaging in that then did, she, did Mary have to go full term? Did she really have to go full term? And so that's a question that, that kind of uh, stands out. But the Bible says in verse 6 that um, while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. So this kind of gives us insight that she carried the child. And it also says that she was great with child, which means she was far along. So she carried Jesus for the nine months, you know, according to the time of life, the cycle of life, Jesus, uh, he incubated in the womb of Mary for the set period of time according to, according to life. She carried him full term. Okay, I just wanted to kind of uh, point that out. That was just a, a question that came up. And verse 7 says, and she brought forth her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And we see again the circumstances surrounding Jesus' birth. He was prophesied to be uh, the Savior, the Christ, right? The anointed one, the Messiah. He was prophesied to be King of the Jews and not just King of the Jews, but King of Kings and Lord of Lords, the Son of God, right? All of these wonderful things. And, and we would think that the birth of a king uh, would be a little more lavish than what we find here in our lesson text. We would think that, 
you know, they would have rose petals and they would have the best room, the best hotel. I, I want, want to talk about that, that end piece as well, but that we would think that he would be born under better uh, circumstances because he was pronounced to be a king. But God here is really, he's showing, uh, he wanted to show the humility, okay, the humility and the obscurity uh, of Jesus. He wasn't coming to be like an earthly king, you know, uh, to live lavish, but he was coming to do eternal work. He was coming for the purpose of bringing salvation to all mankind, okay? And so the Bible says that she wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and swaddling clothes is basically pieces of, of cloth uh, or blankets put together, and the baby is wrapped in uh, to secure them. And this is, this is an, uh, done as an act of, of parental care. This is, um, you know, not something that to, to be looked down on. This was custom to wrap the baby in swaddling clothes. But what was peculiar and what was strange was that he was laid in a manger, okay? She laid Jesus in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And a manger, basically, they were in like a, a barn. And the manger was the container in which animals used to eat their food. It held the animal's food and it held the animal's water, okay? So Jesus was laying in uh, something that was used for animals. That is what was uh, probably, we would say, demeaning kind of. Why would somebody who loves their child, and we see that she loved her child, she wrapped him, she, she secured him in swaddling clothes. Why would she lay him in a manger? But the Bible says there was no room for them in the end. And a lot of times, you know, down through the years, we, as we rehearse the story of Jesus' birth, as we rehearse this, most of us think the, of an end. When we think of an end, we think of like Holiday Inn, like a motel, a hotel, or a tavern. But um, and this time, during this time in Jerusalem, an uh, inn was considered a guest chamber. It was known as a guest chamber, which was a part of those who lived in the town. It was a part of their home. So basically, it wasn't an uncommon thing for uh, Israelites to travel and go into other countries and stay for a long period of time. And many times where they, where they lodge, they lodge in the resident's home, people who were already there and Either they lodged by, either people would be hospitable and they would just invite them in or they would pay to stay in, in their guest chamber. They would pay strangers. And, you know, we never thought we'd see the day where it would be okay, but this was cl clearly happening. It's okay to stay in a stranger's house. Most of us won't do that. But we do find that now it's, it's a popular thing now through Airbnb, okay? I just try to connect and make everything relevant to today's time. But again, it's not referring to an actual motel or hotel. So what happened was there was no room for them in anyone's home, basically. And so this is where Mary ended up giving birth, okay? Again, his birth, the circumstances surrounding Jesus' birth uh, was uh, very humble circumstances. Jesus started, he came into the world with very humble uh, beginnings. Unlike Caesar Augustus, if we were to kind of relate him to Caesar Augustus, who was king or who was emperor at the time. He was emperor of, of Rome. And one of the things I found in my study is that uh, Caesar Augustus, after he died, um, he was praised and celebrated as a god, right? And so uh, somebody who was, he was the first emperor, and we see that he was, uh, praise as as Lord. He was referred to as a Lord. But God here in the text uh, really wants us to understand that what Paul said, that Jesus Christ is Lord, that all will confess that Jesus is Lord. Okay. Uh, we're going to move on and we want to talk about the birth announcement. Okay. 
the birth announcements found in verses 8 through 17 of our lesson text. And we're just going to kind, kind of examine this as uh, the angels appeared to shepherds abiding in the field who were keeping watch of their flock. The first to know of the event were not the religious elite. Let's take note of that. But shepherds on nearby hills. Shepherds were an almost outcast uh, group of people. They were considered low class, uh, uneducated. They wouldn't be con uh, people who would be the first uh, to receive invitation to a party, right? But God saw it fit to have his angels proclaim the news of Jesus' birth to the lowest of society, you know, according to, to people, which were shepherds. So shepherds, this the, the Bible tells us or shows us that shepherds have a special place in the heart of God. In fact, we see through all throughout through scripture that God himself refers to refer to himself as a shepherd, right? Uh, the Lord is my shepherd. The Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Even Jesus himself called, uh, he called himself uh, the good shepherd, according to John 10, 11. And so he identified uh, with shepherds. Shepherds uh, was started, I'm sorry, was started as a frightening moment because again, when the angels appeared, they appeared uh, with the glory of God emanating from God himself. But anytime you see the, uh, uh, a being, let's just say, for example, you know, you, you're walking down the street and you just see this bright light just shine and then uh, an unearthly being just appearing, something supernatural, miraculous, your first instinct probably would be fear. And so when the angel appeared to the, the shepherds, the first thing they said was what? Fear not, right? The angel said, fear not, because we bring we're bringing good tidings or good news of great joy, which shall be to all people. And um, I want to spend a little bit of time uh, here with our golden text. The angel said, for unto you is born this day. In the city of David, a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Okay, let's examine that just a little bit. Uh, the fullness of time had come, according to Galatians 4 and 4. God's promised blessing of the Savior and his redemption had manifested in the babe named Jesus. Matthew tells of a star heralding the news to Gentile kings. And Luke reports the angel's proclamation to the shepherds. From the highest social class to the lowest, this was good news for all people, right? Jesus came to be Savior for all people, not just for the rich, not just for the poor, but for all, right? And so uh, some of the, the uh, through the long-awaited announcement, some of the terms that we want to kind of examine in our golden text is, Savior, Christ, and Lord, okay? The um, angels refer to Christ as Savior first, the first title they use. And in their message to the shepherd, this reveals Jesus' assignment, Savior. David referred to God as his Savior in a psalm of thanksgiving for deliverance from his enemies, according to 2 Samuel 22 and 3. And what was Jesus he was our savior, not from a physical enemy, but he came to be our savior from a spiritual enemy, which we know is Satan, right? Who, who his purpose in the earth is to, to kill, to steal, and to destroy. Satan's purpose in the earth is to keep us in the bondage of sin, right? So Jesus came as a savior to die for our sins, to die in our place, okay? God declared to Isaiah that he was the only Savior, according to Isaiah 43, 11, Isaiah 45, 15, and verse 21. The Greek word used in Luke is soter, which is strongly connected to the Hebrew word yasha, 
This term in the context of 2 Samuel and Isaiah emphasizes that the one being saved has no resources of his own to escape the situation. So guess what? I just talked about Satan and his purpose. We don't have the power to escape that situation. We don't have the power to escape sin, but by divine intervention. And that divine intervention came through the birth of Jesus Christ, the greatest gift. Okay, it's Christmas. We're talking about uh, God's gift to the world today. Okay, um, the angel of the Lord who spoke to Joseph in the dream said that Mary's son would save people from their sins. It was this salvation that God had told Jeremiah about, according to Jeremiah 31, 34. All of the prophets spoke of Jesus. The prophets, many of them spoke of Jesus' birth. Some of them spoke of, of Jesus' suffering. Some of them spoke of Jesus' resurrection, his burial and resurrection. It was all prophesied. And so we're just saying in our lesson text, God's word being fulfilled uh, from, from the prophets. The second term that the angels use to announce the birth of Jesus to the shepherds is Christ. Christ, this Greek word that the angels use in their announcements harkens back to the Hebrew title of Messiah or anointed one. It is a title given to the ruler that appears in the 69th week of Daniel's 70 week vision according to Daniel 9, 25 to 26. In Psalm 72, we read about the hope that Israel speaks of the Messiah's worldwide kingdom and several of his oracles, according to Isaiah 42 and 1 and 49 and 6. The Christ would be the royal son whose kingdom would not end, which God had promised to David long ago, according to 2 Samuel 17 and 13. The last term that the angels refer to uh, the born Savior as is Lord, okay? This last term that the angels ascribe uh, to the newly born child addresses Jesus' authority, while the Greek term kurios is used in reference to an owner or a master, it is mostly used to signify the name of God, Yahweh, in Hebrew, Okay? This is the only place in the New Testament where these three titles are used together in this sequence. The angel's announcement declared not only to the shepherds, but to the world that the promised Savior in Christ is indeed the Lord God himself. Okay, so I want to go back really briefly. That was just to expound upon our golden text, which is uh, Luke 2 and 11. But I want to go back really briefly Back to the announcement and how after God, after the angels proclaimed the birth, the sign was that the shepherds would know that this was the true Messiah. This was the true Savior. This was the true Lord uh, and Christ just by the fact that he was wrapped in swaddling clothes and the, and the, which was not, again, which was not unusual, but the peculiar circumstance or evidence or sign was that he was lying in a manger, okay? In, in, a, in a barn with animals, lying in a container that animals use to eat their food and drink water. And so the angels went suddenly, and I want to talk about that really briefly, because here we see when the, as soon as they receive word, as soon as they receive the good tidings or the good news uh, from the angels, the shepherds, it said that they went immediately. They moved quickly, right? In their obedience, they moved quickly to see the thing that the Lord had declared. Verse 15 says, let us now go, the shepherds said to one another, let us now go unto Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord have made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And so just as the angels had uh, had proclaimed. But another thing I want to point out cuz I just I just got quite ahead of myself. Not only did one angel appear, but the the text says that suddenly in verse 13, 
there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, good will toward men. These are the thoughts that God think about us. He doesn't want to throw us away. His plan is being fulfilled. His plan was fulfilled at the birth of Jesus, right? He, he, he knows the thoughts that he think toward us. That scripture came to my mind when I read this. Glory to God in the highest and on earth. Peace, good will. This is God's intention. Intentions for us and for the world at large. The angels proclaim peace and good will toward men. And so let me move forward. Once the shepherds confirm that truly this is the son of God. The first thing they did was went and, and shared what they had received from the angel. And they shared the fact that they saw with their own eyes the Savior, the Lord, Christ Jesus, right? It says in verse 17, and when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told to them concerning the child. The shepherds were... We could say the first missionaries going to carry the gospel or the good news of the birth of Christ. At this time, it was the good news that Christ was born, that what the prophets had said and what Israel was waiting for. He was here. He was in the flesh. God had taken human form and their savior had arrived on the scene. OK, so we just wanted kind to examine that. As we celebrate today uh, the birth of our Savior and we see that, you know, we give gifts to each other and we go and we buy gifts. Some people go broke. Some people are depressed on this time because they don't have money to buy gifts. But let us today be reminded of the true purpose and the true reason why we celebrate. And I know this sounds cliche, but truly Jesus is the reason uh, for the season. And the greatest gift that we could ever receive is the gift of salvation, the gift of the gospel, the gift of good news, the gift of what God uh, has done for us. The greatest gift given is the gift that God gave to us through the form and through the birthing of his son, uh, Jesus Christ. Okay, so we pray that, or I pray that rather uh, this lesson blessed you. Uh, you were blessed by it. I pray that something was said, uh, something stood out to you uh, that, that touched you personally um, as we're reminded of God's gift uh, on today. As we're reminded of the birth of our Savior. Amen. Well, we're going to close out in prayer and we're going to let you go. Gracious Father, in the precious name of Jesus, Again, we come before you and we say thank you. We thank you for this time, Lord, where you remind us in your word. You're reminding us. And to some, you're informing even for the first time those that are coming by that may have just discovered uh, for the first time the story, the true story of Christmas. We thank you, Lord, and we pray that you would bless the hearers on today, that, Lord God, you would help us to be encouraged. Lord, help us to not be depressed. Let us be encouraged and excited, excited. And let us, Lord God, give you glory today for the greatest gift that we could ever receive. And that's the gift of our Savior, our Lord, our Messiah, Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray, Lord, that you would uh, strengthen the hearts of your people on today until we meet again. It's in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, thank you for tuning in to Timbrel Church Faith University. Join us again next Sunday for another powerful lesson. God bless you.